Good afternoon. My name is John Merkel. I have the pleasure of directing the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning. And uh, on behalf of everybody connected to the center and um, who's sponsoring this event, by the way, in collaboration with the other J. Phillips Center, our partner center uh, at the University of St. Thomas. Um, so in, in, uh, on behalf of everybody connected to these centers, I'm happy to welcome you all here uh, today. Um, and I'm particularly happy to welcome Rabbi Ryan Dalkin to our campus for the first time. We've already had a, a pleasant more than half of a day and um, I'm just very grateful uh, to Rabbi Dalkin that he accepted this invitation and I know he has a lot to share with us in the coming moments. Um, Rabbi Dolkin is, he's a native of Californian, California, but he teaches now at the University of St. Thomas, and he directs there the Encountering Judaism Initiative. Um, he is a man of many degrees. Um, he has a BA and an MA in English literature. He then decided to pursue rabbinical studies, and those studies are often, and I think in your case, probably six years of, of intensive study to become a rabbi. And he also has um, two other masters and a PhD. Um, so um, he has masters uh, in midrash or scriptural interpretation and a PhD in that as well. He has scholarly articles that have been published in journals like the Jewish, um, quarterly, uh, Jewish Studies Quarterly, the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics, the uh, Rutledge uh, Dictionary of Ancient Mediterranean Religions. Um, and speaking of ancient Mediterranean religions, um, given the topic today, you all know, right, that Christianity emerged in the matrix of uh, Mediterranean society, and particularly in the in the matrix of uh, the Jewish world at that time. And many Christians down through the centuries have drawn inspiration uh, from Jewish wisdom, Jewish literature, Jewish religion. Um, but unfortunately, many Christians down through the ages have also uh, become quite anti-Jewish. And that anti-Judaism um, morphed into something even racial eventually, an anti-Semitism. And um, I suspect that's one of the things that motivates you to give a talk titled What Christians Get Wrong About Jews and Judaism. Um, and you are a perfect person to do this, and I look forward to you enlightening us. So please help me give a very warm welcome to Rabbi Ryan Dolphin. Uh, okay. It is uh, so wonderful to be welcomed here at St. John's, and, uh, and I want to thank Professor Merkel for this opportunity. Uh, we did not quite know that it would be as timely a topic when we first came up with it uh, of, over the summer, uh, but uh, alas, here we are. So um, I want to start out with a bit of a personal story, and then I'll, uh, I have a few ideas that I want to share with you, but mostly I want to make sure that I leave enough time for a dialogue. So um, it turns out that it will be, this year will be my 20th anniversary of finishing rabbinical school. Uh, I know I don't look it. <laughs> but it's sort of hard for me to believe. And uh, I was thinking about uh, my journey to becoming a rabbi. And one of the first things that I did, get my, my feet wet in the professional Jewish world, was I attended a conference of major Jewish organizations in Seattle in probably 1996. And I remember it was my first kind of exposure to the Jewish world, the Jewish professional world. 
Uh, and here I was thinking about this journey of becoming not only a, a rabbi, but a Jewish professional. And I remember having a conversation with someone who I now don't remember who it was, but he looked a lot like me now, when I, and I looked a little bit more like the students back then. And I remember this conversation that we had. Uh, at, in 1996, the major issue that I think many of us who were thinking about becoming Jewish professionals, primarily uh, uh, rabbis and cantors, people working with Jews, was we were really concerned about how to transmit Judaism in a positive way to the next generation. Uh, my Jewish identity growing up was, I would say, primarily rooted in a negative Jewish identity, in the sort of sense of the, the Holocaust was a major, um, a major influence on the Jewish community, a major influence on me as a, as a young person, and also the state of Israel. Which, uh, so, and that, I think, was true of a lot of Jews of my parents' generation. Um, but there was a feeling that anti-Semitism was dissipating, and I remember this conversation with this particular, uh, probably a rabbi, where we thought, uh, anti-Semitism is going away. And we're going to have to think about, you know, our problem is not going to be having to deal with anti-Semitism. It's going to be dealing with how do we transmit a positive identity? How do, we, how do we reach this next generation, my generation, next generation of Jews, and think about Judaism as you know, the religious aspect, the spiritual aspect, to make that compelling. Not just simply, we're Jewish because other people don't like us. So it's a little bit disconcerting, I would say, that 20 years later, I'm giving a talk on anti-Semitism, and it seems relevant today. So I just felt that it would be kind of a way to preface this conversation. So uh, what I, let's see if my clicker was working. Let's try that again. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So, so the three issues that I want to talk about in this provocative title what Christians get wrong about Jews and Judaism. I first don't want to make the same mistake then of putting all Christians in one box. So I want to start out talking about what do I mean by Christians? Right? Which Christians am I talking about? And then I would want to cover some aspects that I think are still misperceptions about Jews as people. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about, I think, misconceptions about Judaism as a religious tradition. Um, and the, where I'm coming from in terms of which Christians is I'm thinking about my experience, my experience as both a rabbi in the community, uh, as an educator in the classroom. And I'm thinking, what, what kinds of issues am I faced with when students come? You know, I'm teaching now at St. Thomas. When my students, who probably have never met a Jewish person, let alone they, get, they do get a kind of a kick out of the fact that the foundation of a theology course that they have to take is being taught by a rabbi at the Catholic University. So um, I, once they, oh, that seems kind of cool for most of my students. But what, what, are, what, what kinds of things am I having to deal with, uh, assumptions that students have? So I'm thinking about a composite of students that I work with. Also, I'm thinking about um, primarily Christian clergy that I've come into contact with. Um, I also, in addition to having taught at a, um, at, a, at a Catholic university now, I also have taught at a Lutheran college, and I've taught at a United Church of Christ seminary. So I've, I've, I've learned a little bit about Christianity along the way, not to mention that my doctorate which uh, is in classical Judaism means I had to learn a lot about ancient Christianity, including learning how to read Greek. So because I had to learn Greek, no matter when I give a public, transport, uh, a public talk, I always have to call that because it was kind of a pain. Okay? <laughs> so um, so th the kinds of questions that I'm distilling, I don't think like, there are certainly many Christians that don't have these preconceptions. 
but I'm trying to kind of think about a composite of issues that I've encountered along the way in my, uh, in my travels. So here, I think, are um, some of the contextual deficits that many Christians have when thinking about Judaism or coming into contact with Jews. And the first one is the lack of personal exposure to uh, Jews and the Jewish community. Right? Many of uh, my students at St. Thomas come from the suburbs of the Twin Cities and also uh, just like here in Saint, at St. John's, many of you are coming from um, ex-urban and rural areas. Not a lot of Jews, right? In uh, probably not a lot of Jews around here, would be my guess. Um, why aren't there a lot of Jews? Why are Jews mostly in urban centers? Anybody kind of think about that for a minute? Why are Jews concentrated there? How many Jewish farmers do you know? Why aren't there a lot of Jewish farmers? Because Jews were not allowed to own land for most of Christian history. Right? Jews were kept out, and I'll go over this, but Jews were kept out of particular economic spheres. Right? One of them was land ownership. So there's not a large history of Jews in agriculture. You would take the state of Israel for Jews to kind of reconnect with the idea of farming. Right? So um, most of my students are coming at, to my class never having really met a Jew, or if they have, maybe very few. I, especially at St. Thomas, I ask, has anybody been to a bar or bat mitzvah? And not a lot of my students have, have been to a bar or bat mitzvah. That's the coming of age ceremony in the Jewish tradition that uh, teenagers, when they're 13, are called before the congregation to uh, read from the Torah, the five books of Moses, the sacred scroll, and it's a, it's a sign of acceptance into the uh, emerging adulthood in the Jewish community. And if you've never been to a bar bat mitzvah, that means you don't have any Jewish friends, right? So, so that's the first thing. The second one, I think, is a lack of awareness of the historical anti-Semitism that shapes broader conceptions of Jews and Judaism. Now, I'm a little bit of mixed minds about this. I sometimes feel bad that I have to teach my students some of the ins and outs of anti-Semitism, because many of my students don't know much about the history of Christian anti-Judaism. And I might say, you know, thank God. That might not be a bad thing. The problem, though, is I think when we're not aware of the historical aspects of anti-Semitism, we're then doomed to kind of repeat the cycle, right? So this example that I just kind of gave, right, which is that why are there no Jewish farmers? Because Jews didn't hold land. Jews, in, especially in Europe, were channeled into particular industries. Right? So Jews couldn't own land. They couldn't be part of guilds uh, of tradesmen in medieval Europe. So there are not a lot of Jewish plumbers, right? not a lot of Jewish craftsmen. What were Jews channeled into? They were channeled into commerce. Right? And also because of, of, of church doctrine, Jews could fill a niche by lending money. Right? That was illegal or that was seen as sinful by the, by the church in the Middle Ages. So Jews, they're going to hell anyway. So they can, they can lend the money. Um, anybody here majoring in finance? Okay, interesting. A lot of my students are majoring in finance. Okay, Anybody got a mortgage? Okay, good. We like, you know, lending money turns out to be a pretty good thing. Right? For I couldn't afford my house without being able to pay for it monthly, right? So um, the, point, the point that I'm getting at here is that Jews are channeled into particular economic niches, and that sort of dictates uh, ideas of like Jewish overrepresentation in particular industries. So like, think about finance and think about things like um, uh, uh, business, right? For many, uh, for many centuries, j being a, a, the word Jew, was not only a noun, but it was a verb. What does the verb mean? 
It means to cheat you in business. Right? So why do these, why, why do we have these ideas? Well, I think most people don't really know the history of, say, medieval Europe. Right? Why are Jews overrepresented in Hollywood? If they, we want to say that, well, it's a new industry. Right? Jews couldn't break into uh, uh, other industries in the early United States in, in, the, in terms of emigration. So Jews flocked to industries that they weren't allowed to get into in other places. Right? So there's a, there's, a, there's a historical ideology to some of these ideas that most people are not aware of. So I have a friend that I, I, play, I play golf with. And he told me about a conversation that he had had. He'd went to a Toastmaster uh, event. Toastmaster is a, a, an organization where you practice public speaking. I think it's a good networking organization. I know my, my father-in-law got, got a couple of Toastmaster trophies on the, on, the, on, on the mantle. And there he heard a public speech given at a, at a Lutheran um, men's club about how Jews are too powerful in Hollywood and in Wall Street, right? That was this summer, right? So, so th this issue is alive and well, right? So well, I think one of the problems of not knowing about the history is you don't know when you're walking in to these kinds of anti-Jewish, anti anti-Semitic tropes. Third piece. A lot of times when Christians are interested in Judaism, it's not really because they're interested in Judaism. They're primarily interested in Christianity. And so let's be, so a lot of my students begin with, I want to know more about who Jesus was, or I want to know what we are not anymore. Right? And so so this is most of the time it's not I want to learn about Judaism as a self-standing religious tradition and community, but only in as much as it informs me about myself. Right? And then fourth, I would say, um, the other one is like, why don't Jews just kind of get Christian truth? Um, most of my congregants have no idea how Christians read, for example, the book of Isaiah. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 last semester I had taught uh, uh, Luther's uh, uh, screed against the Jews, right? And it's all full of like Luther is like, we just read the Bible. We're the Bible only, right? But all and everything that he's saying, the, the plain sense of the Bible, is a basic Christian reading of the Old Testament, which I'll get into in a minute. Right? So it seems like the Christian understanding of these texts are just self-evident, and why don't Jews get it? All right, so um, those are some, I think, of the, uh, the contextual deficits that I deal with when talking about this subject. Okay, so let me just, I want to talk a little bit about Jews. I think the first one is that for most Americans, Jews have become white. Right? I can pass as a white person. I don't, and when I'm forced to like put on my, you know, ethnic box on something, I, I you know, do I put white, non-Hispanic, or do I put other? Because you know, a lot of times I don't feel white. Like uh, when the Christmas decorations come out on October 25th, <laughs> right? And I've got to hear jingle bells for six months straight, <laughs> right? I thought, yeah, I'm reminded, right? That's not my culture, right? But there's also a misconception that Jews are all white. And part of that is the historical emigration of Jews to the United States. Jews from uh, the, the historical Jewish community uh, first began with Sephardic Jews, Jews from North Africa and, and what was uh, uh, originally kind of tracing their origins, North Africa, to the Iberian Peninsula. Those were the early Jews. Like, so when George Washington first visited a congregation in 1790, he visited a Sephardic community. In the, the mid-19th century, we had a wave of German Jewish immigration. And then after that, my family 
came uh, from primarily Eastern Europe, right? So my, I traced my uh, family's origins to Hungary, Romania, Poland, and Russia. So most of the Jews uh, in the United States are emigres from European lands. In Jewish terms, we call that Ashkenazi Jews, okay? But um, most of the world is not always, is not Ashkenazi. And I think uh, if Jews come in all hues and ethnicities, because Jews have lived in all regions and countries of the world. So we have um, European Jews. We have Yemenite Jews, right? We have Ethiopian Jews, right? And what I think most people don't understand, particularly about the state of Israel, is that most of the population would be considered Jews of color by our standards, right? They come from uh, primarily um, uh, former uh, Islamic countries after the advent of the state of Israel, and uh, many Jews were expelled from Islamic lands after the start of the, after the 1948 war. So here's just an example of uh, emigration of Jews from Islamic lands to Israel uh, after the state uh, is founded in 48. Uh, and you can see there's quite a bit of, uh, uh, of emigration from these regions to Israel, often because of the grow, of growing Arab nationalism, and Jews didn't feel safe in those countries. So one of my wife's personal friends growing up, her family is originally from Egypt, right? They first, they, they fled to France and then came to the United States. But a lot of those Jews went to Israel. And um, a, another piece I think that people don't really kind of understand about the inner politics of Israel is that many of these communities tend to be the more conservative parts of the Israeli society. Um, the, um, particularly Jews from former Islamic lands are particularly suspicious of, of, of the possibility of peace, right? And so they, they tend to vote on the more right, right word side of Israeli politics. So it's, I, I'm not making a judgment about it, I'm just, it's just a kind of a fact, right, that Jews of color, so to speak, tend to be more um, politically conservative in Israel. Okay. Another factor is, uh, uh, that I kind of uh, run into is, how can you can be Jewish and not believe in God? Right, that, th this one kind of throws Christians a lot. Like, if you're going to, say, like the Lutheran club, right, at, at the University of Minnesota, right, you're primarily going there because that's your religious identity, right? And, and maybe you're, the, the students have very wide views of, of Lutheran theology. They don't all agree on the same thing, but they're primarily, it's a religious identity. How can Jews be non-religious yet Jews. It's a confusing thing for, for Christians. Well, the first one is Judaism remains a tribal religion. And what I mean by that is, do you know how I became Jewish? I became Jewish because my mother was Jewish, right? I didn't do a survey of all of the world religions, right? And decided, I'm gonna pick this one because this one makes the most sense. And my guess is that most of us in the room you could say the same thing, right? We're, although there's a lot of flux in religious identity, by the most part, most people inherit the religious traditions of their parents, right? But for Jewish identity, it is, it is transmitted first and classically, at least after the rabbinic period, by uh, being born of a Jewish woman. Like this, this issue is in flux today in modern Judaism. There are some more liberal strains of Judaism that say, well, a Jewish parent, right? So it's a tribal religion. That doesn't mean, though, that it's a racial religion. Because first of all, as I showed, there are lots of different ethnicities that make up the Jewish community. And you can also convert into Judaism. So someone who converts into Judaism 
will, uh, once they have undergone the conversion process, will inherit a new name. They usually take a Hebrew name. And they also are then designated as the son or daughter of Abraham, our father, and Sarah, our mother. Right? So they are kind of adopted into the tribe. So the first one is it's the kind of the structure. There's no like belief requirement. Right? I didn't have a choice at eight days to get circumcised. Okay? But the second piece is that often being Jewish is, has been primarily defined by others. Right? Um, and this is a particularly, I was Jewish in the past whether I wanted to be or not. And I'll get a little bit into that uh, when I talk a little bit about the history of anti-Semitism. So what I mean by that is that even if I wanted to get into, say, general society, there were barriers for most Jews. And we have a history, particularly in the early 20th century, of Jews creating parallel institutions to Christian ones, right? So we have the, the advent of Jewish hospitals. Why do we have Jewish hospitals? So Jews can get health care, right? Jewish country clubs, right? If you, there's no more exclusive kind of institution in the United States, though probably there are more, but I can't think of one off the top of my head, right? Country clubs, right? They're not going to, for most of you, Jews couldn't get into them. But how did you show that you were part of wider society or more affluent society? You joined a country club. So Jews created parallel institutions, right? So it's not that Jews didn't want to be part of the larger culture, but they were often prevent, prevented from being part of it, right? So I'm saying there's an aspect of Jewish identity that is both internal, but then there's also an aspect that is external. So this brings me to anti-Semitism. So uh, this will be my anti-Semitism in three minutes piece. Um, so most Christians don't understand the context of, of, of anti-Semitism, and that it's really made up, I think, of three, three, there are three legs in this stool. Right, and maybe I'll, I'll use that as, uh, that was no pun intended, but maybe I'll make the pun anyway, right? Um, the first one, and I'm gonna go over a little bit, is Christian anti-Judaism, I'm gonna save that. But the second one I've already alluded to, which is this idea that Jews have outside influence, that Jews exert outside political and economic influence. So here we see, uh, I have some images for you, I don't know how well we can see them in this light, but here would be an early version of uh, sort of medieval money lenders, right? And what would happen is, uh, is that um, Christians, Christian leaders, would invite local, would invite Jews to come and settle in their, in their land, right? So maybe like the, so the famous, the Bishop of Speyer in Germany invited a group of Jews to come and live in this little hamlet that they're creating. Why did the Christians want some Jews to come? Because they brought economic activity. They could lend money because the church wouldn't uh, uh, lend money. And they also brought commerce with them, whose Jews were, um, had networks of commerce. So the, the local bishop would invite a uh, community to settle with the offer of physical protection They'd put them in a separate space in the community and build a wall around them. They became ghettos, but they originally built for the physical security of Jews to protect them from the Christian, uh, the Christian peasants. And the second thing that they did is they gave them economic incentives. Right? And so Jews uh, would settle in these lands, and they, um, over time, many of the local peoples would become indebted to uh, these Jewish money lenders. Anybody love getting a call from a creditor? Right? Even if you don't owe money, you still like, you know, I still kind of freak out, right? You don't really love the people that you lend money to, right? So then, you, so we have all, we have this religious anti-Judaism. Now we have a kind of a cultural or a societal or an economic anti-Semitism. This usually uh, led to the local lord, who was not the original local lord that brought the Jews in, but a subsequent one who then would, would accuse the Jews of either um, some kind of ritual murder 
it's called the blood libel, or of exploiting the community, and they would confiscate all of the Jewish wealth and expel them. So the history of Jewish settlement in the Middle Ages is a history of inviting Jews in, they, they fill an economic niche. Once the economic niche is no longer working, they get expelled. So we have this history of uh, what I'm going to call cultural anti-Judaism. Anti and then the third piece is develops in modernity, which is racial anti-Judaism, uh, anti which becomes anti-Semitism. So where does the term anti-Semitism come from? Well, what is a Semite? Okay, newsflash, there is no such thing as a Semite. We can speak of Semitic languages. Those would be languages in a particular family that would be Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, just as a few examples. But the term Semite is made up in the 19th century, and it's part of this growing 19th century pseudoscience of race. That, the, that um, in the wake of the Darwinian revolution, like, um, human beings are not all related, but there's some kind of biological differences between different peoples. And surprise, white Europeans sit on the top of the racial hierarchy. Right? Below that would be Slavs. And then well below that would be Jews and people of color. And so this is part of a... A, 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 a pseudoscience that develops in the 19th century. Um, race is not a biologist. I'm not a biologist, but as far as I understand my reading, bio there's no such thing as race from a biological perspective. Last time I checked, almost every human could mate with anybody else. Right? So, but this idea develops in the 19th century. And so there's a f now a feeling that I'm not only a Jewish by religion, but I'm Jewish by biology. And as Jews are invited into uh, the emerging European societies of the 19th century, there's a backlash. And a lot of that backlash comes in racial terms. So I've given you kind of a few examples here. So uh, Richard Wagner wrote in his Screed Jewry and Music, where he's decrying the Jewish influence in Western music, he writes, the Jew who, as everyone knows, has a God all to himself, in ordinary life strikes us primarily by his outward appearance, which, no matter to what European nationality we belong, has something disagreeably foreign to that nationality. Right? So you could just tell who a Jew is by looking at them, right? because it's because it's biological. You have another, um, uh, an, an, I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on this excerpt here. Um, this is by Carl Eugen During, where he's putting Judaism now in racial terms. Right? He, he writes, I return, therefore, to the hypothesis that the Jews are to be defined solely on the basis of race and not on the basis of religion. The diverse admixture of our modern cultures, the sprinkling of racial Jewry in the cracks and crevices of our natural body must inevitably lead to a reaction. But what is he talking about here? He's imagining the people, the folk, as a biological entity. So what happens when Jews start marrying into this, the, these, this people? They're infecting the body, and the body is reacting to it. Now, who are the Jews that he's talking about? He's not talking, generally speaking, he's not really talking about people who self-identify as Jews. But he's talking about Jews who convert to Christianity. Because one of the ways that you got ahead in 19th century Europe more easily was once the floodgates were open, was to convert to Judaism. I mean, sorry, to Christianity. So what he's talking about here is that Jews who are becoming Christians are now infiltrating the body, the body of the people. And so the blood of the people is being contaminated, right? So Jews are a biological threat, right? That's the language that ultimately leads to the Shoah and, and Nazi ideology and the destruction of six million Jews, right? It's not enough, we can't convert the Jews. 
because we're just making the problem worse, right? The only answer is to exterminate the Jews, right? Because that will protect the blood of the people. So whenever you hear a politician talking about foreigners polluting the blood of the people who live here, this is the ideology. All right, so those are some of the major things I'm talking, thinking about Jews. Now let me talk a little bit about Judaism. So most Christians are unaware of the history of intellectual anti-Judaism in the church. Um, sometime in the fourth century, uh, m I, most scholars, including me, would argue that we can start meaningfully talk about a, Judy, a Christianity separate from Judaism. Right? I'm going to say, I'm going to put the marker at Constantine. Okay? Um, we see elements of this ideology in the New Testament. I'm going to say in a minute that the New Testament is a Jewish text, so just wait for, wait for a second. Okay? But the ideology that kind of emanates, or is once this text is seen as Christian, and all of the Jews spoken about in the New Testament are now ethnically other, right? A, a, an idea develops in, Jude in Christianity that, which we'll call supersessionism, right? That Jews don't get the Bible. Jews are stuck in kind of reading just the surface level of the Bible, and they don't understand the spiritual meaning. And the spiritual meaning is Jesus Christ, right? So for early Christianity, the way to read the Bible, I like to teach my students, is there's a secret decoder ring. The secret decoder ring is Jesus Christ, and you put it over the verse, and then you'll get the true meaning, right? And so Jews don't get how to read the book, so they're carnal, they're part of the body, they don't understand the depth of it. They don't understand the spirituality. So this basic idea works its way into, uh, into Christianity. And now, what does New Testament mean? Testament means covenant. The Brit Hadashah, the new covenant. So God has, re has removed his favor from the Jews and the new elect of Israel is the Christians. Right? So that's the ideology that develops in the early church. And it's symbolized all over European, uh, European um, art. Here's an example uh, of these, this famous statue that come in pairs, uh, Ecclesia and Synagoga. Right? Ecclesia and Synagoga, those are feminine endings in Greek. That's why they're depicted as women. Right? So on the left, we have the church. And on the right, we have the synagogue. So they're twins. Notice that they're twins. What, how is uh, Ecclesia standing straight up with an with a, with a, uh, 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 erect posture? She's holding the scepter of rulership. She's got the chalice, the, the, um, the, the, you know, the cup of the Eucharist, and she's regal. What do we have on the right? We have the synagogue. Notice how she's bent over. It's not really easy to see in this, but that, that line that's by her head is the, a broken scepter, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, authority has been broken. She's blindfolded. She's blindfolded because she can't read the scriptures. And she's got a tablet in her hand. And what direction is the tablet? It's down, right? Because she's hopelessly lost in the law. Okay, so this, this, you know, if you didn't read, uh, and most people didn't read in medieval Europe, right? How do you communicate ideology? You communicate it through visual arts, right? So here's an example in the visual arts of this basic idea. Um, so what are the sources? of Christian uh, anti-Semitism. The first one is, I think, tendentious readings of the New Testament. So one of the things that I like to teach my students is the New Testament, it's a Jewish text. Why is it a Jewish text? It's written by Jews. All of the, Jesus was Jewish. All of the apostles were Jewish. 
Paul was Jewish. He kind of says it many times in his letters, right? He's creating, I think, the context for what will become a, 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 de a de ethnicized Christianity, but it's not there yet. When the gospel writers are, uh, are, are talking about the Jews, they're talking about their fellows, right? That aren't, don't see the light. But the writers of the New Testament are the real Jews. Right, this community is the real Jews as opposed to the Jews, the, the, the general Jews who don't get it. Because we're talking about a Jewish sect. An apocalyptic Jewish sect. So when John is talking about the Jews, he's talking about the Jews who don't get it. But he's not claiming that he's not Jewish. Right? But then these term that this term becomes the Jews starts to mean other when Christianity crosses the threshold from Jewish ethnicity to primarily Greek ethnicity. Then if you're, if you're reading this text in Rome and you're a Roman, a Gentile Roman, when you read the Jews, you're reading those other people and not us, right? Another um, example would be early Jewish Right, I mean, early Christian writings, and I won't belabor this too much, but I think a lot of early Christian writing is trying to figure out how we're not Jewish. How is it that we have this Old Testament, but we don't follow it all? Right? Can, Jews eat, can Christians eat pork? Like, how is it that the, by, this is part of the Bible, but we don't do it? Right? That's something that, that early Christianity has to deal with. And so they are, so I think a lot of early Christian thought is imagining who we are by how we're not Jewish anymore. And the dialogues that they have with Jews are not real Jews. They're made up Jews. Right? The early church fathers are not really sitting around talking to the rabbis. Okay. Um, so th this uh, quote on the right, which I'm not going to read, but this is an example of what I'm talking about, Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trifo, where he spends a lot of time talking about how the Jews don't understand the Bible. This one on the left, right, is from the lectionary. It's just basically a reading of John, uh, the book of John on Good Friday, right, which is about the passion of Jesus Christ. And what do Christians for millennia here in church? The Jews killed Jesus. Right? And this is still, as far as I understand, a, 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 a liturgy that, that is still being read on Good Friday. So if you're reading this as the Jews, right, then you're, you're communicating throughout the generations that is somehow the Jews are responsible for killing God. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up, okay, which is that um, the other, the last piece I wanna say is there's kind of a, on the other side, this is what I'll call like philo-Judaism, like love of Judaism. A lot of Christians come to synagogues and think like, wow, I'm experiencing the religion that Jesus lived. And not understanding that there's been 2,000 years of history. And that the, 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 that the religion that of Judaism is not the same thing as the Old Testament, right? If, you're, if you thought that the religion of the Old Testament is Judaism, when you come to a synagogue, you'd expect to find a priest. You'd expect to find a lot of animals and an awesome barbecue, <laughs> like a one, continuous barbecue. I'm in favor. Okay, I'm the smoker in my family. Uh, not, not this kind of smoker, but the one that you know, makes the meat. Okay, so you come to synagogue, and what are they doing? They're sitting around for three hours reading a book. Where's the rabbi in the Bible? They're not there. Right, and so I think uh, I, I've developed this kind of thought, which is if you want to know what ancient religion looked like, go to church. There's a priest. There's a sacrifice, there's incense, right? That's what ancient worship looked like. So church is more stylized version 
of ancient re ancient religious practice than what happens in the synagogue for some various reasons that if I went into now, I would not leave time for questions. Okay, so um, most people are just lack an awareness of post-biblical Judaism, especially rabbinic Judaism. I'm a rabbi, not a priest. That's a significant term. It's not just the other version of Christian clergy. Okay, so what are some ameliorations that I think we could do? The first one is educate ourselves, right? The history of Judaism from scholars and from Jewish sources. If you want to know what Jewish... Jewish, Jews think, read Jewish sources on Jewish thought. Um, I also think it's incredibly important that Christians understand the Jewish context of the sacred scriptures, right? That again, as a piece of writing, I think the New Testament's Jewish. Not as a religious text, but as a scholar of, of ancient Judaism, it's an important window into a particular sect. In, uh, in the Jewish landscape of the second period. Take a class. I don't, uh, this gets to my last point, this is a little self-serving. Let's reinvest in Jewish studies. Not just because you know, we want to attract Jews to our colleges, but because it's important to, and this maybe it's important to understand religion in general, and if you really do want to understand the history of Christianity, it probably pay, it bear, it's probably worthwhile to learn something about Judaism. So uh, I think a recommitment to this and a recommitment to the movement of Jewish Christian rapprochement after the Vatican II, I kind of feeling like, oh, we, Vatican II is over. We can move on to something else. No. Um, I'm going to end with that. And I am going to uh, welcome your questions. I should also, um, I'm, as John said, I'm originally from California, so I don't always understand Minnesotan. Like, you know, so the, the range of facial expression between, like, that was really interesting and I absolutely hated that is, you know, uh, so it's hard for me to decipher. And also, um, there are no dumb questions. I'm Sister Catherine from uh, St. Ben's Monastery. And I just want to say that there's a group of sisters over at St. Ben's um, that are really studying some of the liturgical readings that, that we read at Mass every year. And they've um, kind of gone and they've put in a few words like some of the Jews or the Jews who were present or, you know, things like that to kind of get rid, hopefully alleviate some of the challenges and the difficulty in the readings you know we can't change sure. it but you know so they've kind of done that so um and i have a few questions i was wondering if you have difficulty at saint thomas or um if you've had any backlash or if or like what people think as far as do you find people think that you're there and then they want to convert you or that you're there and you're like trying to find out the truth, like you were saying, and then therefore you're like searching still. Mm -hmm. And then I have another question um, as a musician. I was just wondering what you, or maybe you have some idea, as far as Wagner's music, do people, um, do Jews like find a Wagner offensive or um, do they disconnect the person with the music? I've always wondered about that. It's, great. it's a great, uh, lots of great questions, right? And as, as, um, as a rabbi, I'm also aware of like how difficult it is to change liturgy, right? I mean, people will you know, have, have died over this issue, right? There's nothing as hard as changing liturgy, so I totally get that. So I'm not necessarily thinking about changing liturgy, but I think it's how is this liturgy being preached, right? Um, the second piece, uh, I, I, I feel pretty welcome at St. Thomas. Um, so they seem to like me, I, and, I, and I like them. Uh, and uh, so I don't really feel that. I don't really feel, um, um, I, 
it's that's not to say that I've heard like you know in some places maybe there might be a little bit of vestige of like conversion, but most of the people don't do that. I also tend to be the most in my classroom, the person most knowledgeable, <laughs> in you know, uh, and so I don't. I don't say that, I, just as a professor, the students, and they're from Minnesota or the area, they have a hard time challenging authority, right? So I don't really kind of feel that, <laughs> right, um, as much. But um, I do have like occasionally, like, um, and really not Catholic students, but I think these are more like evangelical students that, um, you know, they really want to cut, like my, take my Judaism class because they want to, you know, they always got to tell me how they don't believe in this. You know, and I feel like, okay, first of all, we're in the academy. I don't really care what you believe on your paper, okay? Um, but, you know, it's a challenge. I think it's a challenge for some to say, this is just a human experience that I want to learn about. And that's what I'm kind of calling for. In terms of Wagner, right, you're not going to hear, and now I, 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 gave this, I gave this lecture, a uh, version of this lecture, so now I, I got that Wagner is... Um, dun, 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 right? That's the, and then the wedding march is Mendelssohn. Dun, 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 dun. So Mendelssohn uh, is not played at a Jewish wedding because he, he was converted as a, as a child. And he, uh, re, uh, his, his Jewish identity, his relationship to Judaism is complicated. You certainly won't hear Wagner at a wedding. Um, I'm torn. I listen, you know, I'll listen to Wagner and I can like, separate out, like I think this is very sticky question about you know, art versus the artist. Um, I think we can have difference of opinion of that. I know that um, you know, it was pretty controversial when one famous Israeli conductor brought Wagner to Israel. So I think this is an ongoing dialogue. I think there is, an anti there is some antipathy towards Wagner. I'm not like rushing to put it, put it on. I also don't have like 12 hours to spend, you know, but. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, there are some, uh, you know, particularly in, in, in religious contexts, like a wedding, right? That's why you won't hear those, those tunes in a Jewish wedding. Rabbi Dolkin, thank you so much. This is such an interesting and helpful lecture for us. I'm Michael Rubelke. I'm one of the theology professors here. And I was wondering, both in my experience um, in the academy as well as in the parish, I've seen lots of well-intentioned ways in which Christians try to understand something about Judaism, but kind of fail. So for instance, Seder meals, right? in which before Easter, we celebrate a Seder meal, but only with Christians, and no right. sort of influence from the way that that's celebrated with the Haggadah and the right. traditions of the Jewish right. culture. What are some of the ways in which you can see some productive ways for Christians to learn from Jews about their culture and to see a different way mm -hmm. of understanding the Lord who is our common God? Right. Okay, I'm just not sure who you mean, who's common God. I, I personally would say that the Lord is the same between Jews and Christians. Okay, so I'm going to, I don't, I, I would not concur with that. Okay. Right, I don't, I, there's like. You're not talking about Jews. I'm not talking about Got Jews. it, okay. okay. The I'm Lord confused. is the right. same. Because I also teach, like I, I teach the Foundations Theology yeah. course, I'm about to teach the Trinity. Tomorrow, right. I mean, I and I totally that, sure. um, am <laughs> confused. It's still, you know, but I, you know, do my best with it. I think I think Christians are also confused. I mean, as a general, as a, as a mystery. All right. So, um, okay. So I think the Seder is a kind of an interesting one, yeah. right? Um, so you know, Jesus celebrates a Last Supper, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but you know, for the benefit of the the community, right? Is Jesus at a Seder? No. Why is he not at a Seder? Because the, the, the ritual hadn't been invented yet. When does Jesus live? During the second temple period. What would he have done on Passover? He would have sacrificed a lamb. Right? The idea of sitting and reading a book for four hours at dinner, that's kind of what... Uh, if Jews, Jewish worship can be kind of boiled down to reading a book together for several hours. Right? Okay. Uh, and I say that with all the love that I, because I love books, right? Okay, so the Haggadah is the, it means the telling, and it is the order of the Seder. That's a rabbinic invention, right? That's a rabbinic adaptation of how to celebrate Passover 
when the temple's no longer standing and you can't sacrifice, right? So that wouldn't have been what Jesus would have practiced, right? So this whole idea of like kind of reclaiming or Christianizing the Seder, right, to my mind is a little bit like when um, people of European ancestry adopt um, native and indigenous religions, yeah. right? It's a bit of an appropriation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so and that's because like, people aren't aware, right? And this gets back to that earlier point that I think when people go into a synagogue, they think this is the ancient form of religion. And there are, there are pieces of that. We talk about the Torah a lot. The language of li the liturgy for most communities is either all Hebrew or you know, at least a third Hebrew, right? And that's the ancient language. So there's a kind of sense like, oh, we're going back in time. Right, so I think it's just a kind of basic awareness. And this kind of gets back to my original uh, point, which is um, see if you can get invited to a Jewish Seder, mm -hmm. right? Um, or partner with congregations where the, where the Jewish congregants lead the service and you get a chance to experience the religious tradition from its, from its that's, that's kind of my basic. Like when I had to learn like Christianity for my doctorate and I read like Athanasius, like I'm not always going like, well, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. Like I wanna find out what he's thinking, yeah. right? And I think that that's the approach that I'm calling for. That's great. I really appreciate that. That's a very helpful answer. Can you give me, just as a follow-up question, sure. maybe one example where you've seen some productive encounter like that between Jews and Christians? That's sure. Uh, one time I was invited to uh, a Catholic church to lead a Seder. And um, I, so I did it like as a model Seder, and I taught the pieces, right? And so I think like that's a way. Um, listen, I... I'll, I'll take a step back. When I was in rabbinical school, I had the, 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 um, the great fortune of being a part of this organization that brought seminarians together. Me too. Oh, are seminarians interacting? Yes. And um, so I spent the night at uh, the, the Catholic seminary in Maryland, right? And they had a bar in the, ba in the basement. And I'm like, yeah. this is what we need at the Jewish Theological <laughs> Seminary. <laughs> Okay, I'm a fa smoking beer and bourbon. I'm mean, smoking meat. Okay, I'm a happy man. And I got to you know stay up all night, and we're kind of talking with uh, uh, seminarians who are about to you know studying for the priesthood. And I woke up in the morning, and I um, I put on my talit, and I did my I put on my tefillin, and I said prayers in the in the seminary, and I was thinking like. When in history has this happened? Yeah. Right? And so I think the fact that I'm a you know, professor at a Catholic institution, that a Catholic institution is vi inviting me to have this, I think this is an example of that. Right? And so I, um, I am incredibly grateful for the development of you know, Christian Jewish relations and Vatican II, and I say, let's recommit to that. Thank you, I really appreciate that answer. Any more questions? Yeah, let me just grab the microphone. Oh, okay, oh good, yeah, thanks. I do it all. <laughs> well, I'm just curious to know, uh, when you're done with your classes, do your students have a different perspective? Do they feel a little bit more enlightened? Uh, you're not going to change their mind, but have you educated them, I guess? Does it uh, yeah. I, well, that's my prayer. <laughs> but I think that's the prayer of everybody who ever teaches a classroom. But I, I, the, my approach is especially um, I, I try to get students to see religion as a human endeavor and that all religions are instantiations of a basic human characteristic. So I'm a kind of a big believer in the cognitive understanding of psychology and that religion kind of emerges from the human mind. So we're all religious. It's just the question is like, which religion? 
And, and so I think a lot of my students think like, Catholicism is religion, or Lutheranism is religion, and there are other religions, and they're just kind of deficient versions of those religions. And what I try to do and communicate is, no, there are religions, and Catholicism and Lutheranism are, part, are instantiations of those religions. But I think I try to get students to see religion in a broader context. And so if my students can leave the classroom uh, articulating the difference between an academic approach and a confessional approach, which I'm going to call being in church or synagogue, I'm a happy person. <laughs>